and I should still stand here. Okay, welcome everybody to this um, webinar at Lynx. And today we have uh, eminent scientists from all the way from Australia who came here to us in Lund to talk to us about uh, profiling flocculation and sediment sedimenting particles with neutron dark field imaging. And um, for those who doesn't know Chris Garvey, he is um, a man with many um, instruments in his uh, box. Uh, he's uh, mainly a scientist at the uh, Anstor, working with sons and so on. But um, the creative nature of Chris doesn't see any limits. And uh, he also is a very um, imaginative uh, thinking when it comes to, um, to finding new application for scattering techniques. And uh, he has done some uh, very important contribution in, in the field of cryoprotection and, uh, and uh, cellulose films and uh, cellulose interactions. And uh, I don't dare to say uh, polyethylene because then he will take up all the time uh, <laughs> talking about polyethylene, but he has actually made a significant contribution there to the environmental aspects of this. So we are very happy to have you here. And the Chris has been here for more than a year. More than a year. Yeah, more than a year. And we are happy that he stay until Christmas. So, oh, yeah, um, there's some presents on the list there. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Oh, please. Thank, so thank you, you very much, much Tony. Yeah. Uh, so the, the title is a little bit of uh, false advertising. I will actually get around to talking about it. But what I thought I'd also do is just give it an overview of what I think of the, the achievements of being here and, and, and also what the, what the future holds. So if that works, if that works, this will work. Okay, um, so just, just a little bit of a reflective moment here. Um, I, I, coming here after being an instrument scientist for about 20 years in Australia, um, it was kind of thinking about the new sort of, it was a new beginning for me, thinking about the new kind of things that I, that I, that I could do and uh, some new horizons. Okay, so I arrived in Sweden. That's my toolbox. Um, with some stuff in it, some knowledge, some uh, aspects of using small angle scattering as my trade for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is something that I knew I've taken on as imaging, uh, working in real space. And for people who are not used to scattering, well, real space seems perfectly normal, but there's very much a, 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 a mind. A, a <laughs> A dilemma when you're thinking about you combining small angle scattering and, and imaging, and uh, this is the, the, the interesting area that I'd like to talk about today. Okay, so this is what I'm used to doing. Is um, and I've shown this slide a lot. I think this is the most uh, usual slide in one of my talks. Um, this is my trade. This is what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Uh, mostly, I've been dealing with transmission sacks. And it's a very good technique for um, recreating structure within a three-dimensional structure within a, a volume of material. More recently, I've been involved with uh, what I call one-dimensional techniques, which are reflectivity and lamellar diffraction. And we've used this to look at mostly in problems in membrane biophysics. And indeed, uh, I, I uh, organized a school in uh, Munich at the start of my uh, uh, time here. What I've got involved with more recently is um, what I call two-dimensional scattering or, or gazing incident scattering. So the one-dimensional looks at uh, information in the direction normal to the surface. And for example, if you're interested in layers, you can get the thickness and the composition of layers. Or if you're interested in diffraction, you could look at the spacing between layers on a substrate. Maybe this is going to work. No, no that's not going to work at all. So these are my layers on a substrate, and if one does um, grazing incidents, one looks at organisation in the layer itself. So if, for example, if you have proteins or there's some periodic structure. Okay, 
So just a brief overview of what I've been involved with here. And as Tommy said, I get uh, sidetracked rather easily or I'm imaginative. <laughs> um, I've had a long history of looking at, at, at scattering from cells, particularly with genetic aspects. Um, I've started a collaboration here uh, with Magnus Carl Quist in the area of looking at um, cells and how they respond to the external conditions and looking at the organisation in the context of yeasts used to produce ethanol. Um, I have quite some history and I've actually collaborated for I think about 10 years now with Andreas Stafford and other things so I want looking at um, how red blood cells regulate their volume. And uh, uh, recently, or in the last few years, I've been working with Rob Corcoran, looking at the organisation of membranes within photosynthetic organisms and tissues. I'm not going to talk so much about that. Uh, what I will talk about a bit more today is looking at gel networks um, from the perspective of digestion. So a lot of foods are gels and how things uh, get in there and digest them. Um, and at a fundamental level, we'll be looking at the statistical physics of gel formation and how that's affected by, for example, applying an external feed like shear. And there's some very pragmatic uh, applications of this in food science. Uh, in, in the case of dairy gels, cheeses and yogurts, uh, we've been looking at uh, how uh, the, the, the fractal dimension of these, uh, the organisation within it affects the, the chemical properties of the food gel. Um, and sort of expanding this a little bit more to vegetable proteins, this perspective of scattering on uh, structure and uh, the transport and mechanical properties of food gels. Uh, I also dabbled quite a lot in complex fluids, uh, mucins, which is a collaboration in Malmo. Uh, meat substitutes, again, this is using foods, uh, proteins to make foods, which are a bit like meat. Um, and uh, what I'm mostly going to talk about is sedimentation in sludges. So real chemical engineering. Um, one of the perspectives I've had for a long time on soft matter is, uh, is order and disorder. And uh, this is a fairly, um, it, it seems uh, very abstract in terms of applying it to real systems, but things like looking at organization of skin lipids, you can approach this as a problem in uh, organization, uh, the organization of cholesterol in skin. Uh, I am going to talk about polyethylene, but for only one slide, and uh, various kinds of semi-crystalline polymers uh, has always, always been a, a great interest of mine. And the, 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 the stuff that pays the bills for me as a small angle scattering person for a long time has been just structural characterization of samples in solution. And in this case, I've collaborated with Marite at Malmo, uh, I have a large grant from the Australian Research Council to look at various kinds of medical nanoparticles and how they enter cells. And uh, another co collaboration here in Lund is on the uh, protein that uh, is responsible for laying down uh, teeth mineralization. And uh, what, what the, the, the major part of the talk today is going to be about dark field imaging. And these are the particular aspects that uh, I'm going to be ap uh, applying this technique to. This is the new tool in my toolbox. Um, just coming back to the way I do things, um, a long time ago, or well, 2015, I organised this meeting, uh, which was an ESS science symposium, looking at diffraction as a way of understanding how uh, soft matter. Um, there's this really nice, really old book. Uh, it's not really an original idea, but um, a lot of structural biologists, particularly people that do crystallography, think of, you know, you want a, an ideal crystalline structure and know where all the atoms are, but it's actually quite a powerful tool to, to be able to characterize disorder in soft matter. And I think this is a huge role for, for the new instrumentation of ESS and most synchrotrons these days. And I'll just give a few examples of this. Um, skin, or the lipids in skin are terribly well organized. But this nice, um, cartoon here and um, it's, it's a barrier so things aren't supposed to diffuse through and um, one, can, one can look at the, the transport properties of this, how things get from one side to the other in terms of the kind of disorder there and uh, there's a, 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 a Knowledge Foundation uh, grant with Emily Wilson um, to, to characterise the, the order in this. But to, to come back to this diffraction problem, one can use diffraction to reconstruct the structure of these things. And because the lipids are so strongly ordered, it's a very powerful tool for characterizing these lipids. Here's the polyethylene. 
<laughs> Again, it's a lamell structure. So most of your packaging has this quite strong lamella organization. And this is typical of this. These are small angle stepping patterns from um, different kinds of packaging. On the far side there, there's a package of Nesquik. And you can see this bump here, and this is the, the, the distance from here to here. And if you go out into the, and this sample is actually connect, collected from around the Caribbean, you can see the bump is disappearing. And as they get older, the bumps disappear completely. In this work here, we just showed that what happens to polyethylene over time is that this lamella structure is disrupted. Now, if you think of polyethylene as a barrier material, it's supposed to stop things diffusing in. This is a very effective barrier for oxygen diffusion. So what happens when the thing's sitting in the sun is that it cuts these polymer chains more or less randomly. This structure is a kinetically frustrated state. And so when you melt the polyethylene and blow it into something, it forms this structure, which is an effective barrier. The polymer chains want to crystallize, but they can't crystallize any further because of this entanglement. So what happens when sunlight or UV comes along and cuts it, it starts to crystallize more and it causes the lamella structure to disrupt. And it's very clear from the small angle scattering. So this seems to be the general process of degradation. But if you think of oxygen diffusing through this, it would seem to be much easier. And I think what's possibly happening is that the, this process actually catalyzes the further oxidation of uh, polyethylene in at least the marine environment. And um, it, it's kind of, and the story's here, uh, and, and this work was supported by the CNRS and uh, the Paris University of Paris Cyclone. What it seems to say is that polyethylene uh, pollution isn't quite as bad as first thought. These are very small bits of plastic. Little birds are not going to choke on it, but what it seems to say is this is oxidized into carbon dioxide much more quickly than people expect, at least in the environment, marine environment. This is the second most common um, slide that I've shown since I've been here. Um, and, and this is some, some experiments that I had planned that were maybe interrupted by the coronavirus. The simple idea is if one has a soft, self-organized system on top of a flat surface or even a textured surface, how does the order that this will, because these are made of lipids on the form of another phase, how does that propagate into the bulk? And so the, 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 the meaning of this as a hard interface with a soft interface is a really interesting question. And um, we, we have some experiments planned to do this. But obviously it will be a lamella phase here. And um, as you go into the, the bulk, it will turn into a, a cubic phase. But also there's some uh, biological relevance to this. Um, if you think about what different kinds of uh, peptides or proteins might do, this one here, this is a protein, a peptide that we've shown does not disturb the uh, cubic lattice at all, but this one turns it into a lamella phase. So even at the interface of biology with hard surfaces, proteins have a very important effect on how they order. Okay. Um, looking at ordering in, in, in flow, we have a nice um, project looking at how if you put a particle into a particle that you want to stick to the outside of a capillary, we want to um, look at how it behaves in flow in what's affected uh, the blood, which is effectively a pneumatic phase, and we're using microfluidics to do this. Uh, looking, as I said before, looking at how mucins, when you extend them, um, the chains line up, they almost become a pneumatic phase. It's quite a strong collaboration with different uh, synchrotrons, both Diamond in the UK and the Australian synchrotron. And uh, this is quite a nice project to look at um, looking, producing meat like textured food. And this, a lot of this has been funded by the ARC. So, sludges, <laughs> what I've really looking, been looking forward to talking about. Um, I'll start off in this talk with really defining a very simple problem. Well, it looks like a simple problem, but it's not. And then I'll go to a less simple experiment. And then I'll talk about measurements. Um, some experiments we did in Australia. 
looking at very low angle scattering and some imaging experiments where we use the small angle scattering ex experiment for the contrast. Small angle scattering signal for the contrast. These are, these are real samples. So the typical kinds of applications that we're thinking about here are sewage engineering or any kind of sludge um, where you have particulates and you want to suck water out of it. You want to remove the water from the, from the, uh, the other stuff. Uh, looking at cheese making, how dairy gels form. Uh, one can think of a cheese as a, these, uh, what I'm talking not about is these mass-produced cheeses you get at the supermarket, but the cheeses where that are made of several microorganisms, it's kind of like an ecology, that you have some on the outside, which are quite happy in oxygen, some on the inside, and they make quite different kinds of textures within the cheese itself. So this is why imaging is really a nice uh, problem, uh, a nice way of looking at this problem. Uh, looking at digestion and uh, um, biotechnology. And the underlying theme here is to do, of course, one can always put a, a sample in a, a neutron beam and making a measurement, but making this in a situation when we can apply this to the real situation. Okay, this simple problem. So you have particles, maybe in solution, and you have gravity. And these have been, and they may be, I've actually even made it a bit more complicated than it could be, these are ellipses. And one sprinkles on them on the top and they start to fall down. And up the top, the major interaction is gravity working on it and the interaction with solvent. And as you get down to the bottom, as you have more particles, they start to interact with each other. And one, arrives at a profile where there's more at the top and some at the bottom, uh, sorry, more at the bottom and some at the top. The, the green is supposed to be a, a concentration gradient of these small particles. Now, one is not so interested in the microstructure here, but in the gradient of microstructure. And this is what I mean by one dimensional profiling. That if one takes a line across here, the structure is all pretty much the same, but as you go down, there's a gradient. And the, the strength of that gradient or how change, particularly the, the concentration changes is to do with this hydrodynamics, how long you waited and how the particles interact with each other. So as, as I try to define this, what I call one dimensional imaging, that there's only one dimension really that you're interested in defining the problem, um, that you have a, a, a moderate or poor or variable spatial resolution. So if one has a, a column that's very tall and things happen very slowly, you have a, 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 a huge spread out of the, 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 the interesting phenomena. And the spatial resolution that you need is much poorer to, to, to represent the spatial statistics of the structure. If everything happens much more quickly, um, and, and, and if you, you know, get large particles and sediment them in water, everything happens too quickly. You need to measure very quickly and you need very good spatial resolution. In context of X-rays and neutrons, X-rays gives you very good spatial resolution because you can make a very small beam and measure on a very small spot. Neutrons, um, because you never have many, and generally the, the bigger the spot, the more statistics you have to measure and there's all other kinds of um, uh, consequences. Um, but generally the, the, the spatial resolution isn't as good, except in the experiments I'm going to talk about. So if, if you think of my picture here, what we're going to do is move this green dot, which may be bigger or smaller, depending on the problem that we're interested in, or um, the, the kind of uh, technique that we're using. And, and look at the variation of structure down the column. Kind of problems that I'm going to talk about in this particular section are, uh, are looking at dewatering of filter cakes. Um, basically, my colleagues are, are chemical engineers who want to de optimize this process, so make the water suction as efficiently as possible. And there's a whole heap of uh, different kinds of uh, applications that one can think of. Uh, as I said before, sewage engineering, uh, mineral recovery, so you make uh, uh, grind up rocks and put them into water, uh, water purification when one wants to remove sediment from water for drinking, that kind of thing. This is a collaboration of mine with um, Marcus at PSI 
and uh, Liliana, who's also uh, an instruments person who, who works on the, the USANS instrument there. Um, these are some really nice applications of it. This is a battery for making toilet bowls. So this is exactly the kind of problem that I'm talking about. What they do is they get clay, mm -hmm. they pour it into a mould, and they want to suck water out of it. This is really mass production, but uh, these are a couple of my papers. There's four of them there. They're in fairly high impact journals. Um, they don't describe them as filter cakes, but that's essentially what they are. You've got different kinds of particles, different kinds of interactions. You suck water out of them. You maybe put some salt in there to mediate the particle interactions. But by just by doing, considering um, this very simple paradigm, one can produce very advanced materials. So I hope I've sold you on that. That's a really interesting problem. <laughs> but when you do sludges, <laughs> When you do sludges, um, this is a typical sort of situation you might have. This thing might be metres across, that you have a, a rake at the bottom for stirring it. Um, you put in a feed of particles and you might put some polymer in there to aggregate them. And what once, one, one wants to do is the particles to go to the bottom and to collect more or less pure water on the top. If you uh, make this as efficient as possible, you can um, um, collect these particles, they may or might not be valuable. If it's sewage, uh, it's not terribly valuable. If it's some kind of mineral bearing rock, it's a lot more valuable. But certainly you want to separate it from the water as efficiently as possible. That's an environmental problem. Now, really the, 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 the problem for me, the thing that really makes me interested in this is, okay, it's, it's a particle suspension. And um, I, I certainly that um, small angle scattering is a really good way of putting it in but you cannot put one of these in a, in a neutron beam. You cannot put one of these in an X-ray beam. So really the challenge is to have a representation of that industrial system. And um, if, if you were going to do a scattering experiment, you really need to think about the quality of the data. You need to think about properly normalized data so one can get the, the volume fraction, um, uh, enough uh, information in the, in, in the measurement to do the measurement as efficiently as possible. Um, this object here is not uniform. There's different parts and have different particle packing density, and that's really an interesting problem as well. So uh, spatial resolution, it also happens in, 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 in time. So um, and one wants to be able to measure quickly, and one is never going to be able to put this in the beam line. So this is the ideal. This is what we ended up with. <laughs> these, these are just cubettes, um, just your regular UV cubettes. The, the thing is obviously blown up. Um, we, the model system is really very simple. It's just calcium carbonate particles. And one can buy these off the shelf in a range of sizes from about, I think we're at about two, normally average micron size to about 30. They're terribly irregular. If you look down a microscope, there's bits all, they're not spheres um, by any means, uh, and they're extremely polydispersed. When you sprinkle them on the top, you see that there's a cloud left behind, um, but it doesn't make so much difference to the sedimentation time. They have a slight negative charge just by nature of the surface chemistry, and all this is done in D2O. The other thing I've done to this is, uh, you've noticed if you compare this one here to this one here, this one's got a kind of lighter and fluffier texture. What we've done with this one is we've added a flocculant, which is a long, um, they're usually polyacrylamides, and just by the basis of the charge, you can actually control the linear charge density on them. But what they do is they cause the particles to drop more quickly, but in this much fluffier, much fluffier um, sort of texture thing, there's exactly the same mass of, um, mass of calcium carbonate in this one compared to this one. But also, if you think about it, the water is going to flow through this much more easily. It's a much more open structure. So what you have here is a much more open structure that water can flow through much more easily. We can do water more easily, quickly, and it settles more quickly. So we use neutrons. Um, I've been doing USANS for a long time um, at different 
uh, facilities. In fact, one of the facilities uh, recently died. Um, these are the, so there's the BT5 instrument and NIST, it's quite a nice one. I don't think they're going to have a, a use hands instrument here. Um, at the ESS, uh, there's, there's one in parallel, quite a nice instrument in, in, in Prague. Um, and, and the one that I'm going to talk about mostly today is the experiments we've done and ASTO on Kukabo, which is a really nice instrument. I'm also going to talk about this imaging experiment where we use the small angle scattering contrast, the small angle signal, small angle scattering signal as the contrast. We've done these experiments at PSI on two beam lines, ICON, which is a specific beam line for doing uh, cold neutron imaging, and BAR, which is a sort of general um, multi-purpose beam line at PSI. In general, I'm going to show some curves, USAMS curves, and I'm going to assume that if you see something with USAMS, you're going to see it with this dark field imaging, or the, 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 the variation of the dark field imaging under certain conditions, which is to say if something's possible with USAMS, then there's a capability to do this with, with dark field imaging. And there's a Hankel transform, but I'm not going to talk about that at all, which is the conversion of the two representations of the, the data. Uh, here's Kookaburra. It's, it's kind of, uh, for people, so you have SANS instruments, and they're typically the biggest instruments in the guide hall at, at most facilities. You think with ultra, they'd be bigger, but they're not. Uh, they're really quite simple instruments. So you have neutrons and you have a, a, a first monochromated crystal and the neutrons bounce along it. And the point with this is that it, it monochromates it and collimates it. It's all going in a very um, a specific direction. And as, and as is usual with, with small angle scattering, you put a sample in the beam and the neutrons are scattered by the sample. And one measures the scattering as a function of rotation angle around on the second analyzer crystal. This is a kind of sc scattering curve. You have, these are actually uh, yo uh, dairy gels in um, D2O. So we measure a point at the time. Each of these points represent rotation of this crystal. So there's some tricks when you're trying to do kinetics with this because as you move it, it's obviously changing. So each of these curves represent a couple of hours to measurement. Um, this is, uh, and, and you can tune the number of points you have. The more points, obviously, the longer you, you take to measure. So the instrument is quite compact. This is the sample area here. And on this case, we've got a, a, a sample changer. And because we're measuring things in the micron range, they tend to sediment. So these are, quite, these are rotating sample changes to stop it settling. This from the top to the bottom is, um, probably about 80 centimetres. The beam is quite big, it's of the order of centimetres big, so you need big large samples. But in terms of my um, sedimentation experiments, this looks like a really nice space to put a, a column with things sedimenting, and indeed this motor moves up and down so we can move it in and out. We haven't got round to that yet though. So these, this, is a, this is the kind of sample that we've used. This is probably about five centimetres across. Um, what we've done here is that, as I said before, the beam is um, quite large, and the larger the beam, of course, the shorter the measurement. What we've done is we've uh, used some of the optics on either side to focus the beam in through a sample. So this is a sample that we've been rotating, and we've allowed it to stop. And so you have a top level and a bottom level, and we've scanned the beam through here, and, and with this, you can identify the interface between the particles and the, um, the, the, the D2O on top. And one can measure different kind of scattering curves. So this is all intensity versus Q. Um, there's a decay, and they maybe change a bit. Um, an important thing is that we, we always measure that there's a difference between the, the bottom and the top. In a normal kind of measurement, you just use a big beam in the middle. This is the other kind of instrument that I'll be talking about. So this is uh, the, the kind of setup they have at PSI. Of course, in some respects, you still have neutrons, but it's a big neutron field. 
and there's some gradings here. And uh, we put the sample in the neutrons, of course, is quite common in neutron scattering. And uh, we vary the distance between this gradient here and the sample. And we produce images on, um, on, 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 on a, some kind of detector. Um, here's some samples. So here is one of these kind of images with one configuration. And uh, what we've done here is plotted the DFI, which is some measure of the intensity on a pixel, as we've varied the uh, detector distance. Um, so here you can see in the transmission image, it looks pretty homogeneous. Um, and, and indeed, that's what one would effect, expect for solvent. Um, here is the transmission uh, image of, so we put some hard, uh, some charged spheres in there and it looks fairly homogeneous. But if you look at the dark field image, there's contrast at the bottom. So what I have here is um, several of these curves where we've taken one cut here, position here, and we plot the, the DFI value versus something which is related to this distance here. And uh, at the top, where the particles are fairly far apart, I might even say that it's like a gas. One gets this kind of curve. Um, as they sediment a little bit more, you have uh, liquid-like behavior. And at the bottom, um, one has quite well disordered material. It's actually close hexagonal packing. So this is really quite a nice experiment. And one can show at, uh, this sample is actually the equilibrium. That equilibrium, there's a, 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 a there's some a certain amount of crystalline material, some liquid material, and some gaseous material at the top. And you might expect if you're able to sort of perturb the solvent conditions, like put, for example, put a bit more salt to shield the interactions between the particles, one might shift the position of that equilibrium. Indeed, that's what you observe. And that's in that paper there. So this was the starting point for this work. And this is the beam line itself. Again, coming back to thinking about putting this great big Thing, the ideal measurement, uh, this rake thing where you mix the sludge, that's really not going to fit in there. Neither is it going to fit into the use as instrument. So this is always the problem with these kind of measurements to learn something useful from a model system that you can put in there. So what I've got here is my camera shot. So I always take a photo camera. Uh, uh, from my phone, it's probably still there. Uh, what I've got here is some particles of different sizes, with and without um, the flocculant. The, the bigger, fluffier ones tend to be um, tend to be the, the flocculated ones. If you look in the regular transmission um, me uh, measurement, um, you can't see any difference between the two, between any of the samples actually. So there's the meniscus of the solvent. There's, uh, there's some particles about there, there's some particles about there, but because of the nature of the interaction of neutrons with this kind of sample, you can't see them. Here's a sample of just of some baker's yeast. One can see it quite clearly there, you can't see it there. This is a sample where we've laid, uh, we have three layers of 35 and 30 um, particles. So let's just look at what happens. Now, I didn't test out the capability to do movies here. Excuse me for a minute. Okay. Let's see what happens if I play that. No. Turning up at all. This is fairly important, so I'll just take some time to the whole talk falls a bit flat if I can't show you the video. Um, what I might do 
Let's just go to another viewpoint. See how it works. Might be the cursor, the, the pointer. No, that that's might it. interfere with that. Ah, I do need to show this because it is quite important to get rid of the pointer. Down here. Huh? Ah, if I get get rid of that one. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, now now we can play it. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I don't have to describe it all. So each of these images is a slight change in in the in the the distance between the the sample and the grading. And I'll go back through this again. But you can see that very clearly compared to the transmission image almost as clearly as my phone, although it did cost a lot more money uh, to do this, you can see that the, where the sediment is, is really quite clear. One well, can see in this layered structure, I'm gonna play it again. So let's look at this layered structure here as we go to these different lengths. You can see there's a band appearing there and a second band. So it's able to image the difference between the different size particles. Now, um, the, the other thing here is that this field of view is really quite small. Um, it's about 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. So the opportunity to do a very long sedimentation experiment where one gets very clear separation of the particles was fairly limited. But one can distinguish between the different size of particles. The other thing I'd like to, and I'll play this again. So one can clearly see, not as clearly as these particles though, where the yeast cells are sitting on the, the bottom of the cell. And I'll come back to that later in the, in, the, in the talk. But just from the perspective of imaging, just from the perspective of being able to visualize things, this technique allows you to see the different kinds of layers. One other observation I'd like to make about this is that, um, and, and what I've done is I've plotted the, the dark field intensity as a function of uh, position. So if you were to take one of these here and lay it on the side, and this value here, the correlation length is the different distances related to the different distances between the, the, the grading and the sample, is that um, for, for these, fairly, these kind of samples over here, that it's fairly homogeneous that this uh, shortest length is all pretty much the same. Um, the, the, as you change the length, it, it all varies fairly uniformly. So there's no change in the particle. Well, the, the experiment can't see any change in the particle distribution as a function of position in the sample. So in terms of the original aim of the experiment to see uh, separation, clear separation of the particles, it doesn't work so well, but I think that's not surprising really, given that's only about five centimeters from the top to the bottom. Okay, so that was a really nice proof of principle experiment. It works really quite well. Um, in, in terms of what, what I want to do next, this is the thought process in my mind, uh, that each of these DFI images represents about half an hour of measurement time. So for one DFI curve, you need to make a lot of measurements. And um, moving the sample. The, the use ends is fairly, uh, fa fa fairly similar, but it, it's easier to move between points. The spatial resolution for the DFI measurements is incredible. But um, I, I think that, 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 that we, we haven't really uh, used it in a, in a, in a useful way yet. Um, maybe in, in, in terms of being able to resolve the different layers of particles, which we couldn't resolve by any technique. Um, and, and we can visualize the different um, kinds of particles and, and possibly the number of particles in there as well. The spatial resolution of USANS is, 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 is useful 
a certain kind of experiment, but one also must think about the, the, the kind of acquisition time that you have to use. And how, how to put this into a useful context? Because beyond just imaging things, one usually extracts structural information from scattering curves. I mean, imaging people look at something and say, that's something round. We're not usually really looking at that, but we can see the layers, but we can't see the particles in that layer directly. And that's where, where the analysis comes into. In. Now, these are very featureless curves, um, like a lot of you say it's curves actually. And, and um, this is really, this is where, 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 where where we're sitting at the moment is how to convert that DFI curve into useful structural information. And I think the key to this will be with the USANS curves, we, we, we put other information in, and this really hasn't been done for the DFI curves yet. Um, for example, the volume fraction of particles. And to get some simple numbers rather than trying to extract everything from modeling the data. We also have a, a nice collaboration with Patrick Judenstein, who came and did these dark field imaging experiments. It's always good when you come to do a, a, an experiment at a neutron facility and you're collaborating with somebody who's doing a complementary experiment for them to actually come and do the experiment with you. And I think this is a really useful interaction. And indeed, I, I've been doing the, the NMR imaging experiments with him virtually via Zoom. So that's quite nice. Okay, so proof of principle, and this is where it's going. Um, applications in, in, in food technology. So as I said before, gelation, and I'll do a bit more effort to convince you that's useful in the next couple of slides. Um, dairy gelation, plant gelation, what I call undulation, which is uh, what well, is effectively digestion, pulling that network, that gel network apart. Um, I, I, I've really covered this topic fairly well at this stage, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more at the end of the, 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 the presentation about applying this to to, to um, cell biology or industrial cell biology. So gels, if you think of what a gel is, at one level, if you gel milk, you can't pour it out. It sits in the top there. And the reason for that is that you have some structural element that's aggregated to form a network, continuous network across the container. So in the case of a glass of milk, it's a, a gel structure from one side of the milk, uh, milk to the other. It may or may be more or less fluid. If you've got cheese and you do that, it's probably okay. Yogurt's gonna get a bit messy and a bit smelly eventually. This network has a, a fractal dimension and, and this fractal dimension has often been used to describe the mechanical properties of uh, colloidal gels. But recently, the, 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 well, not that recently actually, uh, this paper's 1989, but not much has been done about it because I don't think there's any real way of measuring it. Um, but one can understand the texture and the mechanical properties of a dairy gel or the different kinds of yogurts or cheese just on the basis of this fractal dimension, how the aggregates are put together in space. Now for colloidal gels, this, the fractal dimension of this has really been related quite extensively to the kinetics, how fast they add this diffusion the limited aggregation, how fast they add, add, add together. And, and the really appealing thing about USANS is that it, it acts as a direct characterization of the fractal dimension of this 3D network. And this is just some experiments that we've done in the last couple of years that we're in the, in the, in the, in the um, process of uh, writing up. This is uh, skim milk, so there's no fat. So in my cartoon here, the green blobs are the fat and the red dots are the casing myself. This is skin milk, so there's no um, there's no fat in there. But one of the cool tricks you can do with uh, neutrons is contrast out the fat, so you just see the network. But that's not done here. So what you start off with seeing is just this form factor from casing my casing my cells or little spheres. And what happens as they aggregate together is you get this up here, and the slope of that is related to the fractal dimension of the, the network. This is some work I've done on the SACs on a pea protein in Malmo, um, not terribly good data, but one of the interesting things about it is that um, it was just a case of, you have to heat them up to 90 degrees in a capillary. It's very hard to do that uniform. In fact, I'm hoping to do that tomorrow. And um, this is, again, you have unitary uh, bits that aggregate together and as they gel, they form 
um, a, a network with the fractal dimension characterized by the slope here. Um, another really quite cool thing about doing um, with neutrons is apart from the contrast variation is that you're actually able to put microbes in there and do it directly. This is something you can't do with x-rays. We have similar plots here. So this is an enzyme, Rennet, it comes from a calf's stomach. You can put microbes in there. You can look at what the, the casein mice cells are doing with the microbes in there because we've adapted them, the, my, the microbes to live in some kind of D2O mixture. And the neutrons, they're perfectly happy. And so one can see the formation of the network directly in a microbial process with neutrons. I think that's kind of cool. So looks remarkably similar to the last slide. I put the word un in front of gelation, and this is a heterogeneous uh, process. So in, in the gelation, it's the aggregates, and it happens more or less uniformly over the entire sample. But for, for, for if you want to put some enzymes in there and digest it, they're of course going to work from the outside in. And this network may provide a, 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 an obstruction to free diffusion into the network. And this is where quite likely that looking at this with the DFI will be very powerful. Uh, tool one be able to, and this is some experiments we did at ICON a couple of weeks ago. Um, we weren't able to get it to digest, but one can clearly see where the gel is here. And uh, if you have a solution of enzymes on the outside and they're attacking in, and one has a, a, a scattering curve for every point in here, one can look at the relationship between the structure and how easy it is for the for the enzyme to access inside the 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 the, the, the structure. So again, one can use, look at uh, really quite nice applied biological problems. So we're into the home straight here. Um, what I'm finally going to talk about is uh, red blood cells. And this is, uh, so at one level I've been working on this for a long time. Um, I've been interested in the, 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 the connection between the biochemistry of red blood cells, how they metabolize, how they use ATP, because this is how they maintain their shape and the rheology of blood. But it turns out these are a remarkably simple system for looking at the effects of shape cell uh, volume and sh cell shape and volume on new cells. And we've just sort of published a nice little paper in the last couple of weeks. So it's a very, very simple system. So it has no nucleus, so there's only uh, protein inside, about 30% volume fraction of haemoglobin. We'll come back to that in a second. About 50% of the volume of blood is, is erythrocytes, depending on, on, on what kind of organism and how much you've had to drink and that sort of thing. It varies a bit. Um, they, as I said before, they actively regulate their volume. They use metabolism. They use burn ATP to keep that shape. And what we'll do is in a minute look at what happens um, by changing the shape to the scattering. But in terms of the scattering problem, biochemically, it's a very complicated thing. But because most of it's this stuff, 30% volume fraction inside the cell, there's a lot of other proteins there that are no doubt biochemically important, but scattering is a fairly coarse view on structure. One only gets a view on that. The cell membrane, which is really important, because if you don't have cell membranes, you have hemoglobin drifting through your blood and they clog up your kidneys, is really important from a living perspective, but that's not the same as a scattering perspective. There's very little of it, so it doesn't contribute to the scattering signal at all that you can measure. So in some sense, uh, the USANS experiment dumps down to the problem so you can um, make some useful information. So I got a student to do this. I like saying that. <laughs> we got some cells, a lot of cells, and we put them on a slide. And we're interested in what happens to the shape as they run out of uh, glucose. As I said before, they consume glucose to keep, uh, to, 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 um, keep their shape. They turn that into ATP. Now, apart from the fact that the red blood cells will interact with the glass of the slide and change their shape, the student counted cells for a long time. Actually, I think what they did was they took pictures of a long time and then they looked at that. 
And you can see the error bars here. So from, from my perspective, looking at the, the, the effects of uh, the rundown of metabolism on, on the, you know, the, the, by the end of this, the, the red blood cells are sitting in their own metabolic poisons and they get a more unhealthy. It's not a terribly good way to do it. We don't have good statistics. That's reflected in the noise here. Um, and I think if we've got several different students to do this, depending on the expectations they had on the experiments, we might get quite different results. Not a very good way in biology. But to do the USADS experiment works really quite nicely. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the analysis at the moment, but at one level, um, we've got cells which are isotonic. This measurement took about four hours on the, um, the instrument, the ILL. So we had to put some sugar in there, always have some sugar in here, so there's no metabolic effects. So I've got another data set with metabolic effects. But what we've done is we've uh, put them in more salt, so they shrink, less salt, so they blow up a bit. And uh, this one here is something that's been metabolic poisoned. You put sodium fluoride in there and the, the, the ATPases don't work very well. I'm not going to go into this in a great deal of detail, but I'll make, the, um, make some sort of general um, comments on it. The first thing to realize in a red blood cell is when it changes shape, the surface area stays the same. Now they, the bicocal discs, they, you put them in a less salty water, 100 millimolar sodium chloride, they blow up a bit like balloons. If you put them in 200 millimolar um, sodium chloride, they shrink down, they become quite compact discs. So the surface area is staying the same. What we're trying to get us at is at the volume. The contrast, as I said before, all the scattering is due to the hemoglobin. So if you have a one cell and you blow it up, the hemoglobin concentration inside it dips, goes down. It's got a bigger volume, same number of hemoglobin molecules per cell. That's an important point. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that this intensity here reflects the volume of the cell. And indeed, um, I'll just come back to that. This is, this is a well-known law in scattering. This should be a minus three slope slit smearing, not pinhole, but it's minus four. But if you plot it like this, and you get the intercept there, you can very clearly um, extract the volume per cell of the average of the number of cells in the neutron beam. So it's a very good measure of, 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 of the cytokrit. It's a very good measure of comparing it to metabolic to see how they maintain the volume. Um, we did actually normalize it to something that we did know. So there may be a little bit of rubberiness in this measurement here. And for this one here, these spherocytes where we poison metabolically, what's interesting about this is that um, they lose surface area. So they shed some of the surface area and they become more dense. But it works quite nicely. So we've shown that and, 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 and in principle, the DFI can, if you look, image things, we can measure the number of cells and their concentration, or the cytokrit, which is mills um, inside a cell per unit volume. I won't talk about this. Um, this is a lot more speculative. We have some published some results, but I'm not all too either happy about going on, on a limb. We can tell the difference between cells that are long ellipsoids, that's or uh, Rods, that's what bi microbiologists call them. Um, we can tell uh, spherical, we can tell the difference between different shapes. That's not too much of a, 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 um, a, a stretch. Some cells arranging chains, and again, we believe that we can see that with the USANs, and we've begun some preliminary measurements with the dark field imaging. So with this toolbox, we actually have a nice way of looking at how cells behave in a mixed culture, how they organize, and really the next challenge is to put these kind of cultures into a beam line. In some sense, we've done this already with cheese, but in the case of cheese, these are these uh, fancy French cheeses where you have different kinds of ecologies depending where you are in the cheese. It's mostly the, the network of the, 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 the milk gel that we see. But I, th I think this is a really nice and useful way to go. So, um, in, 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 my, in, in my toolbox, I've, I've packed some, um, some more tools. 
Um, and I'm ready to go off to the next place to learn about something new. And that's about all I've got to talk about. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions to Chris? Hey, Chris. Steve here. Can you hear me? How are you doing? Yeah. Good. Sorry I couldn't be there. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm here in spirit. I'm here somewhere, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really nice. I think extending the um, uh, imaging to, to the scattering signal is fantastic. And uh, I mean, there's been some stuff done with x-rays where you uh, where you take the real space image and you hit Fourier transform. And, and you can get similar information, but I guess that's a scale above. Um, that's, that's kind of nice. But what I was wondering about um, is one thing you do if you do the Fourier transform of the real space image is you can get the isotopy and things directly. So I guess with this DFI, can you rotate the, um, the gratings and start to get the anisotropy out and things? I mean, I guess the time scale of the measurement goes way up, but if it's a stable system, it could be interesting. Absolutely, and I think they've recently published something like that from uh, from the group group at PSI, imaging texture. I was I was kind of interested in, in terms of uh, imaging uh, texture in wood. This has always been a huge interest of mine. I have many interests, but uh, I, I think the big problem is how 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 measurement time is. And in the case of wood, it's much easier to do it with an X-ray beam. It, it's just a very simple, quick measurement. So I think it's going to be a case of what what kind of systems this is useful for. Flow might be a very good one. Yeah, I guess when it comes to wood and things, I guess, um, or that type of product in Sweden, people are very interested in uh, cellulose flow and things. I guess that would be a very nice application. Uh, Indeed. Of what you're talking about. And I guess if you have a steady state system, so you say flow, then you could actually image it um, while it's flowing and you, 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 you measure over a long period of time. I guess the flow would be long, but <laughs> it could be good. Um, your practical example at the start with the big, um, I don't know what it was, hopper, rotating hopper thing. Yes. How, what was the scale of that? I didn't get, because you said you can't put it in the beam line, but what is the scale and how much could you scale it down? The, the smallest one, one they have in the chem -Eng department at Northern Uni is about a metre across. <coughs> and they get way big. Uh, in, in, in real situations, you know, they'd be uh, 20, 20 metres across, I think. They're really big pieces of engineering. But I think there's a nice challenge to, to, to have a, something that, that, that has the essential physics or the essential fluid mechanics of it in there. And I think that's a question of talking to somebody who, 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 make, who does this kind of work. Um, in fact, that's the, the, the reason for the collaboration. Yeah, that's nice. Well, it'd be nice to discuss this a bit with granular mechanics stuff as well. That would um, be good. And we'll get back to you. I'll get back to you on wood at some point. Yes, the fullness of time. <laughs> <can't> do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. For me? Oh, um, uh, so uh, I have two questions actually uh, related to this. Um, there is a disease called sickle cell anemia, yes. the blood murmur cell, and that is. Um, uh, as I understand, it has to do with the hemoglobin. Yes. Yeah. And uh, have you thought of that? And uh, the other thing is that hemoglobin, if I, uh, I mean, I was surprised to learn from Leipilo and others that this is a really attack molecule. It can, it has a very large penetrability. And, um, as I understand it, and we were trying to apply for a grant where we use it as a torpedo for a torpedo for a drug delivery and so on. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, to come to the to, to the so I, the reason I got involved with our red blood cells to start with was I was working on a project where we were using yeast to digest pig waste. Wow. And and the lab that I was working on was specifically. Um, working in um, bioenergetics. They had a long history using, um, using uh, NMR to study phosphate metabolism. You can see the ATP peak yeah. really well and you can yeah. understand yeah. The, the bioenergetics. Anyway, I was a small angle scatterer, so I said, let's put some hemoglobin solutions or red blood cells in an X-ray beam and see what we get. It's one of those kind of experiments. And you see a very clear interaction peak. 
I was really excited. I was really enthusiastic. And then I looked back and, and Guinea had published this book in his this work in his book. So it, it's been done a long time ago. And, and, and it, there is a fair precedent for rediscovering things because people tend to forget this, but it's not really where, 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 where you go to do new stuff. So the story is with, with the sickle cell is that it's related to the, to the cell volume. Um, and this wasn't just sticking a piece of a red blood cell in a beam line. There was actually some scientific rationalization for it. But what you do see is that this interaction peak disappears. It's kind of like my gels that the, uh -huh. the, uh -huh. the hemoglobin molecules form a gel inside the cell. And uh, it, it's, it is related to resistance to malaria, but nobody's really quite worked out how it works. It, it's, it kills people, but it's actually an adaptation which protects people from dying. Yeah, from yeah, 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 that's a, that's the. It's a it's, it's a weird one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering with your polyethylene, um, with the danger of <laughs> sidetracking you here, but uh, what what you, you mentioned that you it, it happened in saline uh, conditions, the de de degradation. Uh, so, so what is the what is the mechanism? What is the effect of, of having it in, in seawater, for example? For example, this is this is something we want to see whether it's specific. I've worked in polyethylene for a very long time, mostly from industrial processes. So, there's a company that makes um, big containers for um, transferring sulfuric acid around the world. It's an Australian company that you see them here. Um, when when they make them, they make them completely without strain. So it's, it's really very resistant to degradation. And in fact, you don't want containers bursting with sulfuric acid all over the road. This is, this is one of the big things with them. When it goes in the ocean, it, it seems that this structure breaks apart and they oxidize much more quickly. We think that this lamella structure is protecting diff oxygen diffusion and oxidation is what really drives it back into the carbon cycle. Um, we're not quite sure about what 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 specific about the ocean. When we've done a lot of land-based degradation, where you just put it under a UV light, we see quite different pattern. We see this lamella structure actually crystallizes more, and it stays there. So we think there's something um, wrong. Uh, there's something special about having it in the marine environment that causes it to oxidize more quickly. Right, but so but it doesn't necessarily have to be the the. Um... Salinity could be other things. Could be oh, could be organic. Uh, There's an awful lot of stuff there. Biological processes, or yeah, yeah. And I, the, I, 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 I always read this that, um, and I'm not suggesting that we go throw all our waste in the in the ocean. <laughs> Please <laughs> stop me there. But I always read this, and I read it this morning. Plastics in the ocean are worse than first thought. There's a whole industry of science, and I think it's 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 really it's to the detriment of, of science funding in general that money gets put into this kind of activity to show that 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 things are much worse than we first thought. I think we really need to take a much more introspective view on, on particularly environmental problems. Um, the the that's my flag waving. Um, I, I you know it's a really interesting thing and and it's very difficult to get funding to study this sort of thing. That if you show it's really, really bad, <coughs> funding bodies will give you money. Sure. If you show, well, could be this, that's rather interesting. You're not gonna get any money to do it. And we were kind of lucky that the CNRS supported this for, for I, I don't think they were paying attention. Actually, <laughs> what we asked. <laughs> So there's some really interesting questions about the way science is funded everywhere in, in this. And I, I, I think it's, it, it has, should have huge effects on policy. Because just to show, putting huge amounts of money into things to show that they're worse than first thought is a complete waste of money because eventually you're going to be shown to be wrong. That goes without saying, unless there's enough polyethylene in the ocean that the world explodes or something. There was a recent case from Australia, right? Some someone got fired because he, he had a he published something about I think it was coral reefs. He, he said the state was much better than they thought, and then eventually he got it, fired. It, it's it's a huge problem in Australia. We had um, there's the CSIRO. Everyone has the CSIRO, 
Um, we had a, a huge division that did environmental science from a farming perspective. They were modelling climate and showing what the effects of global warming were. And it was very useful to the Australian economy. People, farmers could plan things and, and then they got caught up in the global warming industry to show things which were but worse than first thought, which is fine. I think it's altogether good to be cautious, but what happened was a government came in that weren't very receptive to this idea and the whole section got cut. And at the end of the day, we don't have what we need in Australia, which is to model uh, the climate from a farming perspective. And, 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 and that was a great shame. Any other questions out there? No, nothing from the people online. Oh, blown away. <laughs> 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 what, what can't you say about sludge? <laughs> I think we should uh, thank yeah, Chris for thank this you. very uh, uh, exciting uh, talk and uh, it really shows that uh, Chris is an uh, asset to, to, to links and, and uh, I think he, he has provided so many connections that it, uh, sometimes when he talks about them, my head is spinning, but that's me. So thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.